the Lord be with you. Our class today is class number 10, the blessings of baptism. We're also going to talk about the intertestamental period, which is the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some important historical stuff happens and takes place. It kind of sets the stage for Christ to enter the world in the flesh and the person of Jesus. So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but before we get started, let's uh, turn to page 32 in our small catechisms. As we read, how the head of the family should teach his household to pray morning and evening. In the morning, when you get up, make the sign of the Holy Cross and say, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then we confess the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And instead of praying the Lord's Prayer today, uh, we will sing our hymn once again. And today we are going to sing uh, select verses. We're going to sing the first verse. We are going to sing the third verse. We are going to sing the sixth verse and the ninth. So one, three, six, and nine. And the reason being, since we're going to be talking about baptism, see how baptism kind of ties into the theme, specifically of verses three and six. Okay, <clears throat> ready? Let's sing. Hymn 766, Our Father Who From Heaven Above. Our Father, who from heaven above bids all of us to live in love as members of one family and pray to you in unity. Teach us no thoughtless words to say, but from our inmost hearts to pray. Your kingdom come, guard your domain, and your eternal righteous reign. The Holy Ghost enrich our day with gifts attendant on our way. Break Satan's power, defeat his rage. Preserve your church from age to age. Forgive our sins, Lord, we implore, that they may trouble us no more. We too will gladly those forgive, who hurt us by the way they live. Help us in our community to serve each other willingly. Amen, that is, so shall it be. Make strong our faith in you that we may doubt not but with trust believe that what we ask we shall receive thus in your name and at your word we say amen oh hear us lord all right so don't put that entirely away because we're going to come back to that once we get to more discussion of baptism but let's dive right into it all right so once again class number 10 the blessings of baptism quick review what is baptism let's recite it together baptism is not just plain water it is the water included in god's command and combined with god's words the way we kind of teach it to our kids here so let's say that again <clears throat> what is baptism it is not just plain water it is the water included in god's command and combined with god's word i'm holding that's supposed to be the bible but it's too low you can't see it but you get the point okay which is uh, that word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so, uh, da, 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 da. baptism, we're going to turn to page 
Um, no, we still need to do some re review, but I need to get to the right spot. So I'm going to go to page 208. Well, that's what we're going to pick up today. But uh, so review of baptism. We just did the first part of baptism. Who institutes baptism? God does. Remember, for something to be a sacrament, it has to be three things. What, what, what are those three things? It has to include three things. Instituted by God, with a visible element, for the forgiveness of sins. So God institutes baptism. What's the visible element? Water. And what's it for? The forgiveness of sin. So that's how we define uh, what a sacrament is. And uh, what does baptism mean? Like what does the word baptism mean? It means to apply water. This is in part one. Um, who is to be baptized? All nations. And this excludes nobody. So babies are included. So why would babies be included? Well, there's four reasons that we learned about. Number one, they're included in the word all nations. They're included in the world all nations. Jesus especially invites little children to come to him. So God's grace is for little kids too. Babies need what baptism offers because they are sinners just like everybody else. We don't become sinners later on in life. We are born uh, poor, miserable sinners uh, with because what are the two types of sin? Original and actual. And that means all humanity has original sin and all humanity commits actual sin. So we have original sin inherited from Adam and we commit actual sins of thought, word, and deed. Um, what are the two types of actual sin? Sins of omission and commission. All right, good. All right, now what is the fourth thing? So why? there's four reasons why we baptize babies. Number one, included in all nations. Number two, Jesus invites little children to him. Number three, babies need what baptism offers. And number four, babies are also able to have faith. We know this to be true because we have the instance, the example of John the Baptist, unborn John the Baptist, leaping in his mother's womb uh, at the sound of Mary's greeting uh, that she was pregnant with the Lord, uh, the Savior. All right, let's jump into it now. Part two of baptism. Let's recite it together. What benefits does baptism give? It works. Forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. Which are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. <clears throat> so notice on the first part of baptism, when we said, where is this written? It was Christ the Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew. And now here in the second part of baptism, as it is the second book of the New Testament, it begins... Which are these words of promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark. So remember, part one, Matthew. Part two, Mark. Just a little thing I know sometimes our students get uh, get confused. Okay, so we talked about, we just learned here now, the benefits of baptism. Let's, let's kind of hash that out, see what it means. So let's go to question 248. What great and precious things are given in baptism? Well, as we said, baptism A works forgiveness of sins. Look at those Bible verses there, Acts 2.38. This is on page 209, uh, Bible verse 846, Acts 238. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And that next verse, Acts 22, 16, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So we see there's this washing away of sin in accord with baptism. There's a relationship because remember baptism means to apply this water and so it's this wonderful illustration and imagery of being clean, being cleansed, being washed away and in baptism it's our sins that are washed away. So it works the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> B, it rescues from death and the devil. And look at Romans 6, 3 to 5. You're going to have to memorize this when we get to part 3 of baptism or is it part 4? Can't remember now. Might be part 4. If I could just look a couple pages ahead. Uh, it's part four. You'll learn this with part four. Okay, so Romans 6, 3 to 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, these are my words, but now, back to scripture, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And you don't have to memorize any of these verses yet, but I do want you to memorize this next one here. Uh, 849. So circle it in your catechism. Circle it. 849. Galatians 327. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we wear Christ like a cloak in baptism. And this has wonderful illustrations. You see this every Sunday if your pastor's doing his job wearing his vestments, wearing his garments, wearing his alb. Uh, if there's a sacrament or maybe it's a 
Cassock and surplus, maybe even has a chausable or a cope. There's a lot of different names of vestments. But typically at Zion on Sunday morning, we are wearing albs. That's the white garment. And it reminds us that um, it is not... Uh, it, it, is, it is a human being who stands in the stead and by the command of Christ. But also it reminds you that in the same way you wear a baptismal garment, we see this with baptisms, almost all our babies come up with a white garment of some sort, they're wearing something white, and it's a reminder to us of the purity of Jesus. So Galatians 3.27, wonderful verse to keep on our lips. Uh, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we wear Christ like a cloak, and that's, uh, that's the gift of baptism. So it's like we have this gift with us all the time. It never goes away. And, and now we can't see it, right? And so just as with all things that we can't see, we trust them to be true. And that's what faith does. Faith trusts in God's word. Faith trusts this to be true. Faith trusts this Bible verse to be true for us. So we wear Jesus. Um, <coughs> we wear the cloak of Christ's perfect righteousness. And that's what our baptism gives us. So it's this wonderful gift. Okay, so... This is how it rescues us from the death of the devil, because we've been in baptism, buried with Christ into his death, so that just as Christ has been risen from the dead, we too will live in newness of life. We have new life in Christ Jesus. So just as Christ has risen in our baptism, the old Adam is slain, uh, and, 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 and the, the curse of, uh, of, uh, of, of the original sin um, has been forgiven in Christ. Now the old Adam keeps trying to resurrect itself. And that's, why, that's the role of repentance then. So every day we live in repentance. That's Remember, we talked about this in Baptism Part 1. So we live in repentance, and that's as we live in repentance, that continues to slay that old Adam, old Adam. But as we live in repentance, we also live in faith. So we repent of our sins, but we also live in faith, trusting that the old Adam has been slain, and now I wear this cloak of Christ in my baptism every day. And that's my assurance. I'm wearing Jesus. So <clears throat> this is an imagery here. When the Heavenly Father looks at us, he doesn't see my flesh, my sinful flesh. I mean, he loves me, he regard, uh, regards me even despite of my sin. But he looks at me and he sees Jesus. Because in baptism, I'm wearing Christ, like a garment. So he sees the Son's perfect righteousness, Jesus' perfect righteousness upon me. So Jesus covers my sin. And, he, and in baptism, they're washed away. All right, okay, let's flip the page here to page 210. Uh, now this uh, C, we're going to read eternal salvation. So baptism gives eternal salvation. Let's look at these Bible verses. Mark 16, 16, this is part of what you just memorized. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And then I want you to circle the next two Bible verses, 852 and 853. So 852, 1 Peter 321, I want you to underline just four words. You don't have to memorize the whole thing, but I'm going to have you uh, underline... The words baptism, and then now saves you. Sorry, the camera is a little blurry, I can tell. So four words, 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you. Gives you eternal salvation. And then circle out verse 8.5.3, which is Titus 3.5. You are going to have to memorize this for part three of baptism, so you might as well learn it now. Um, Titus 3.5, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's review again. What are the benefits of baptism? It works, forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. That was our memory work for today. Now, I didn't have us look at this Bible verse, but I want to look at it now. So look at Bible verse 850 at the top of page 210. Colossians 1, 13, verse 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so there we go. That's the summary of what baptism does for us. Baptism takes us out of the kingdom of this world and brings us into the kingdom of God. It takes us from the family of this world and brings us into the family of our God. And it gives us forgiveness of sins. And what was the last thing? Um... Well, not, yeah, I already said that. Yeah, so transfer from one kingdom to the next, and gives us the forgiveness of sins. And so we have these uh, all these important verses. So uh, of all the parts of baptism in the catechism, this is the one part where we have the most Bible verses to memorize. And I want you to commit them to memory because when they are on your mind, it means that they're going to be on your heart. It means you're going to be thinking about them. You're, you're going to be seeing. And when, when, so you're thinking about them when they're on their mind. On the heart is well, how does it apply to me, right? And then when it's when we think about this and how it applies to me. It also becomes 
part of our lips because we realize the glorious gift that it is and it comes on our lips because we want to share that good news with other people and we'll be more confident to share it with other people when we know it and we're confident in it think of all your favorite hobbies all the things that you love to do think about it for just a second you can probably think of two three four maybe five <clears throat> the things that we really love and the things that we really know a lot about man we could talk about that for hours right even the most uh, shy person you get them talking or her get them get them talking about the thing that they really love and they really know a lot about they can talk about it forever and so that's the same thing with how we should view god's word the more we know it the more of an intimate relationship we have with it when it's on our mind it's on our heart it'll be on our lips the more confident and 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 comfortable we'll be talking about it all right let's keep going here uh, question 249 if christ has already won forgiveness and salvation for us and gives all this by grace alone why do we still need baptism christ has indeed won full forgiveness and salvation for the whole human race with his perfect life suffering death and resurrection he distributes this same forgiveness in baptism and here is the first time we're going to see this word i believe in the catechism where it says baptism is a means of grace Baptism is a means of grace. You should underline that. I don't have that underline in my catechism, but it's a good thing to, to, to underline. Um, so means of grace, what does that mean? <clears throat> a means is an avenue or a vessel or an instrument by way of which something arrives to you or to somebody or something else. So um, when I said an avenue, so an avenue is the means by which a car goes from one spot to the next, a street, right? So we have roads, we have highways. You want to drive from Columbus to Cleveland? You hop on what? I-71. You head north. It's the avenue. It's the road. It's the highway. The means by which we go from one place to the next. So in, um, in the same way, baptism is a means of grace. It is an avenue. It is a way by which God gives grace to us. So God's grace are his gifts. Mostly the forgiveness of sins. Life and eternal salvation. These are wonderful gifts of God. Those are the three big ones. Forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And the means of grace are the means, the avenues, the ways by which God gives those to us. Now, we're going to learn more about this um, at, at a later class. Um, but basically, the thing I want you to, to really cling to is the fact that God works through the Word and He works through the sacraments. Those are His means by which He gives faith, by which He gives forgiveness of sins, by which He gives life, and by which He gives salvation. Uh, we have not done this yet, but we will get to um, how the word is uh, is a means of grace. And then, of course, now we are here in baptism uh, with, with the sacrament uh, of baptism. It's a means. It's an avenue. Okay? All right. Enough said on that. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a whole bunch of things going on in my mind, and I'm trying to keep them clear. So we only talk about baptism. We'll get to the other stuff in later classes. Okay, let's keep going here. To whom does baptism give all these blessings? Look at the answer. <clears throat> Question 250. Baptism gives these blessings to all who believe God's saving promises. There's that Mark 16, 16 uh, verse again that we've already learned. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So when we have, when we have faith, when we trust in God's word, we're saved. And in baptism, we believe God's word. That baptism now saves us. We're saved. Thanks be to God. Because faith is what receives the promises. Faith is the means by which we receive God's gifts. So God works through means to give them the gifts. Faith is the means by which we receive them. Okay, so God works through word. God works through baptism. God works through the Lord's Supper. Those are his means to give his gifts. And faith is the means by which we receive them. Okay, all right. 251, is it possible for an unbaptized person to be saved? Look at this answer. This is a good, good, good question. It is only unbelief that condemns. Faith cannot exist in the heart of a person who despises and rejects baptism against better knowledge. But those who believe the gospel, yet die before they have opportunity to be baptized, are not condemned. <clears throat> and the greatest example of this in the New Testament is that thief on the cross. Um, if you remember, uh, the one uh, there's the one thief who, who ridicules uh, Jesus, and then there's the other thief who says, hey, we're up here for just reasons. This man has no reason to die. And he says to Jesus, um, you know, remember me when you enter your kingdom and Jesus says something along the lines of today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, that thief on the cross who was being crucified next to Jesus had no time to be baptized. And yet Jesus still could make that promise because that man believed that Jesus was the Holy One of God. He was sinless. He was dying for, for no reason whatsoever other than, uh, well, the reason being 
for our sins. So Jesus was the ultimate sinner in our stead. So he wasn't actually a sinner in that Jesus committed sin, but he bore our sins for us. So he took on all of them and paid the penalty for us. But either way, he's the lamb without blemish, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And uh, so he could make that promise to that thief that even though he hadn't been the thief hadn't been baptized, he could still be saved. All right, <clears throat> let's go to 252. Why are we not to seek a baptism with the Holy Spirit in addition to the sacrament of holy baptism? Answer. Beyond sacramental baptism, we are to seek no other baptism, and that's in quotes there, because A, there is no other God-given baptism today beside the sacrament of holy baptism. And this great Bible verse, 858 from Ephesians 4, 5. You don't have to memorize it, but it's an important one to note. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one type of baptism in the Christian faith. Not more than one. One, one baptism. Just like there's one Lord, just like there's one true faith, there's one baptism. <clears throat> Note, the instruction about washings does not mean that there are several Christian baptisms, but that the one true baptism must be clearly distinguished from the many religious washings which were common in the ancient world. And that's a reference to Hebrews 6.2 and also to Mark 7.4. So sometimes people uh, will like to, 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 to take this verse out of context as if there's more than one type of baptism. Flip the page to 2.12. <clears throat> the sacrament is not a water-only or a spirit-only baptism, but a water and spirit baptism. Now remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. Look at John 3.5, that first verse cited there. You don't have to memorize it, but look at it. Unless, this is Jesus' words, by the way, to Nicodemus. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is clearly referring here to baptism. Because remember, what is baptism? It is not just plain water. It is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. And which is that word of God? Christ the Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now where there is faith, there is the Holy Spirit. And God works this through baptism. So where there is the water and the power of God's word, there also is the Spirit of God procuring faith, procuring his gifts of baptism. And what are the benefits? This is what we learned today. It works the forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and it gives eternal salvation to all who believe this. And the only way we can believe is by the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way we can receive the forgiveness of sins is by faith. And the only way we get faith is by the Holy Spirit. So in baptism, there is water. And, the, and where there is water in God's word, there is also the Holy Spirit there who works faith in us. Okay, now look at this note here. Matthew 3.11 speaks of baptizing with water and with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The difference here is not between sacramental baptism and some sort of spirit baptism, but between the preparatory mission and baptism of John the Baptist and the full permanent mission and baptism of Jesus Christ. While John's baptism also gave the forgiveness of sins, because remember, when John, with John's baptism is about a baptism of repentance, right? And where there's repentance, there's also faith. So we repent of our sins, we're sorry for our sins, and we also trust that we are in fact forgiven. So John's baptism also gives forgiveness of sins. It was different in that it pointed forward to the redemptive work of the Savior. So John's baptism points forward to Christ. Our baptism today points backwards to Christ. See the difference there? So John's is preparatory. He's, he, he's, he's, the, he's the one preparing the way for the Messiah. Well, the Messiah has already thus come. And Jesus uh, fulfills all righteousness by being baptized himself in the Jordan River, making all baptisms, uh, therefore, a lavish a washing of, 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 of forgiveness of sins for us until he comes again. So our baptism looks back uh, uh, at Christ and, and his redemptive work. <clears throat> okay, and now we got C. The special signs granted by the Holy Spirit were not another baptism, but they proved the truth and power of the apostles' preaching. All right. Um, you may have questions about that. So let's just look at these Bible verses because these are important to talk about. Acts 19.6, when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues uh, and prophesying. Now, an important thing, I think we've talked about this before. In the book of Acts, the book of Acts describes the early Christian church. It doesn't prescribe things for us uh, in the church today. 
So it describes the early church. God works through a lot of uh, unique means. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of different things are happening. He, he is, he is the word, the gospel is going out to the Gentiles. And God is working all these profound and different ways. And the book of Acts uh, records those for us. Again, it describes the events of the early church. You'll notice there, nowhere does it say in that verse, Acts 19.6, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. That's it. Records the history. Nowhere does it say, and therefore the church today, when the pastor lays his hands on you, you should therefore speak in tongues and prophesy. See, there's no prescription um, just, what's a prescription? It's something that our doctor prescribes for us to take, right? There is no prescription that the Holy Spirit gives for the church to do um, here in, in Acts, in this particular verse. There are some prescriptions, but context always determines the meaning. And here in Acts, we don't have uh, something for us to prescribe in a per perpetuity. Uh, it just describes what happened then. Let's look also at 2 Corinthians 12.12. 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with us utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Again, this is spoken in the past tense, uh, that the signs of a true apostle happened then. Yes. And remember, a true apostle, um, in, in the biblical understanding, are those who are called directly from Jesus. So think of the disciples. Think of Paul. Paul's conversion when he went from Saul to Paul on the road to Damascus. So, yes, signs and wonders accompanied uh, all those uh, disciples' workings um, as, as they were converting the world, um, in essence, uh, from pagan religion to Christianity. Um, this this new, uh, new, relatively, religion uh, to the world. Of course, it's the fulfillment of the Old Testament um, Jewish religion. Uh, they believed in the Messiah who was to come. Christianity, though, is now the confession that Christ has come. And he's given us these means of grace uh, to give to the church until he comes again. All right. So uh, I think that should do it for our discussion of baptism. And now we are going to move to the intertestamental period. Uh, so turn to page 269 in your catechisms. It's right towards the end. <clears throat> and it's just important for us to have a little understanding of, our, of, our, of history. And uh, this is what we're going to learn here now. <clears throat> This shouldn't take us too long, I don't think, but I'm going to read it. So, the time between the Testaments, page 269, 432 to, to 5 B.C. During the years between the end of the events of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, God was preparing the world and his people in particular for the coming of the Savior. And then, as Galatians chapter 4 reads, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of the political forces that kind of bridge the Testaments um, as God set the world stage for the coming of Jesus. First is the diaspora, the dispersion. Uh, you might remember this at kind of the end of the Old Testament. The people are sent into exile because of their unbelief. So the Jewish people, I'll just read, scattered throughout the world as a result of the Babylonian captivity. That's what that was. The people went to Babylon. Uh, the Jews that assembled in Jerusalem to hear Peter's Pentecost sermon had come there from all over the world. So since the Jews had been dispersed at the end of the Old Testament, you know, 5th, 6th century B.C., um, since they were all throughout the world, uh, by the time um, when, when Peter preaches his Pentecost sermon, it is when a lot of those people had come back to Jerusalem to worship. So that's why, if you remember, they speak in tongues. And the speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2 is not some heavenly angelic language, but different languages of all those people who had been scattered throughout uh, the ancient world. Um, early Christians began their mission efforts among these transplanted Jews who were familiar with the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which we will talk about in a little bit. <clears throat> Alright, so after the dispersion, we have the Persian period. <clears throat> this begins with uh, King Cyrus's decree in 538 BC that many of God's people um, were allowed to return to the promised land. So this is kind of a political move. Now, now it's, from a human perspective, it's a political move, but God is working through uh, King uh, Cyrus. So the Babylonians, not very nice to the Jewish people. Of course, they transplant them to Babylon. Um, but when uh, the Persians take over and the Babylonian kingdom uh, wanes, the Persians rise to power. Well, what's the best way uh, to, to make, um, how do I say this? Uh, succinctly. What's the best way to make friends with the Jewish people? Well, think about it. <laughs> think about us as Americans. Let's say someone comes in and, and takes over our country and exiles us to their country. Um, and then a new country overtakes them and now they're in charge. What's the best thing they could do to win your allegiance? 
I'll send you back to your homeland. Well, that's what that's what uh, Cyrus does. So he kind of wins favor <coughs> with the Jewish people by allowing them to go back to the Promised Land. Now, I'm going to keep reading here. But their homeland remained a minor entity held under the control of a number of significant political powers, beginning with the Persians. Life under the Persians was, for the most part, tolerant. If you remember Esther from the Old Testament, uh, she had been a queen of Persia. So you see here, now God works through um, the Persians uh, to bring God's people back you know, to the Promised Land. Um, and there's some gospel there, of course. Um, but to notice that it's, it's a political move, too. Because um, he wants to win favor, and that's why he tolerates the Jews. I mean, the, the Persians have a problem with the Babylonians. You know, they're the ones they stick it to the Babylonians. Uh, but the Jews are, are, are don't have any power at this point. Um, they had already been taken over by the Babylonians. All right, let's keep moving. The Greek period. This comes after the Persians. So you know this from your history: the conquest of Palestine by young Alexander the Great, one of the famous generals in the ancient world. Um, Greek at this point. Um, had just basically taken over uh, the Greek culture, the Greek language. Everyone's speaking Greek. It's the lingua franca, if you remember learning that in school. Uh, it's the language that everyone's speaking. Um, that's, how, that's how much of an influence Alexander had. Uh, during this period, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. I told you we would talk about this. So remember, the Old Testament is originally written in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. Now it's translated into Greek, and it's called the Septuagint. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. So following Alexander's death, the empire was divided among his generals. Palestine was passed back and forth from the governance of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. The Jews enjoyed good treatment under the Ptolemies, but things were different under Seleucid Antiochus IV um, Epiphanes, who ruled from 175 to 164 BC. He hated the Jews and sought to wipe them out and their religion. He attacked Jerusalem, he defiled the temple, he placed a sow on the Jewish altar, which was the abomination of desolation that you read about in Daniel, the book of Daniel. Uh, if you want to read more about uh, this, read the Maccabees. Um, uh, this is part of the Apocrypha, good history. It's not part of our biblical canon. We don't draw doctrine from it. But it's good to know the Apocrypha because a lot of the stuff, especially the Maccabees, uh, reads like a history book, and it's interesting stuff to learn about. Um, da, da, da. Uh, what, what else did this guy do, Epiphanes? He erected a statue of Jupiter. He prohibited worship and circumcision. Imagine someone uh, prohibiting baptism for the Christian today. Oh, it'd be a terrible thing. So this is a terrible period for the Jews. He even sold Jewish families into slavery and destroyed every copy of scripture he could find. Wicked, wicked man. <clears throat> but notice, here's the gospel, that God worked even through these horrible things. Uh, he set the stage for the coming of his son, Jesus, the Messiah. Praise be to God. So to notice that even if things were to get so horrible like that for Christians, um, in, in this country or in this world, God will still work through his means of grace. His will will always be accomplished. We can take great hope and comfort in that. All right, so after the Greek period, we have the <coughs> Hasmonean period. Now this is more, um, this this is also, uh, I, I I'm trying to remember here. This is where the Maccabean period uh, comes in. And this is this is first, second Maccabees, those apocryphal books I mentioned a few moments ago. This is really ties into this period. So in opposition to the atrocities of Antiochus, the head of a priestly family, uh, Matthias, and his five sons led a successful revolt and founded a dynasty that unfortunately all too soon resembled that of the Seleucids. But either way, you can read more about that in the Maccabees and uh, in, in the apocryphal books of, uh, of the intertestamental time. Now we have the Roman period. This is the one that we're all familiar with. So up to this point, we know a little bit about the Persian period because the Bible talks about the Persian period post-exile. Um, Esther, again, Ezra, Nehemiah. This is books of the Bible that are you know the Persian period. Um, there's nothing in the Bible uh, from the Greek period or the Hasmonean period except for the apocryphal books, but of course those aren't part of the biblical canon proper. But now we've got the Roman period, and the reason why we know most about this is because think of how uh, the Christmas Gospel, Luke chapter 2, starts out. In those days, uh, when, uh, oh my goodness, in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, right? So we have this Roman Empire, we, or Roman Emperor, Roman Empire, that's the period of Jesus. Um, and it's not too, uh, pre Rome just kind of became came to power shortly before Jesus is born. So from 63 BC to the time of Christ. So in 63 BC, I'm just reading here on page 270, Romans conquered Jerusalem. They killed the priests serving at the temple and defiled the most holy place 
Antipater, a descendant of Esau, was appointed the ruler of Judea. His son, Herod the Great, you know that guy, rebuilt the temple in an attempt to earn favor with the Jews. But Herod was cruel and insecure. So notice, it's rebuild the temple. So by the time we have a temple during Jesus' lifetime, that's a rebuilding of it because it had been destroyed. Remember, it was it was it was it was it was ruined. Uh, it was desecrated by uh, uh, in, in 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 history past. The temple had been destroyed. Herod rebuilds it because he wants to win favor with the Jews. Because what better way to win favor with the Jews? Well, rebuild their place of worship. All right. Uh, he was the ruler when Jesus was born. He ordered the killing of the children of Bethlehem. Um, we sell, we commemorate that uh, with holy innocence. Now I can't remember the day. That is it December 29th. Can't remember my calendar. Should have had that ready. Um, but yeah, we commemorate that in the church. That's on our. That's on the church year calendar. That horrible event. If you remember when Herod had all boys uh, born in Bethlehem in that area of two or less uh, slaughtered. Just because of his insecurity uh, of, of Jesus being, you know, the earthly king that would replace him. But of course, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. Let's keep going. 271. What holy scriptures and other writings were uh, were God's people reading during this period? So this is why it's important to read um, the Apocrypha and these these books that we're about to talk about. Because um, they're, they're a part of the history of God's people. They were, they were reading these things. And whenever we read things, they influence our way of thinking. And they influence God's way of thinking. And this is in part why there was a misunderstanding of who the Messiah was going to be in the person of Jesus. Okay, uh, the Septuagint, we already talked about this. Um, but here's a little background of, of um, how the Septuagint was composed. So according to tradition, this translation of the books of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek was made in Alexandria, Egypt, at the request of Ptolemy Philadelphus. Septuagint, and here's what I want you to know, comes from the Latin word for 70. So according to the tradition, 72 scholars did the work in 72 days, translating the entirety of the Old Testament canon. Canon, member would be the 39 books of the Old Testament. The Septuagint was commonly used during the time of Christ and in the early Christian church as it was written in Greek, a language understood by Jews and Gentiles alike. The Septuagint is frequently quoted in the New Testament by Jesus and the apostles. Now, you wouldn't know that when you're reading your English Bibles, okay? But but this is important because for a theologian or a scholar of the Bible who, who wants to look at the original texts, uh, oftentimes, more often than not, Jesus and even Paul, and mostly Paul and his epistles, when they are quoting the Old Testament, they'll say, like, as it is written, they will cite it almost the exact same way as the Septuagint has it. And remember, if, if you if you don't know this, or, um, or if you do know this, remember that in languages, when you're translating from one language to the next, you are always going to have different ways of formulating the sentences. So English is subject, verb, object. Greek does not have that order. Greek can be any order. In fact, the word order is more, is just for emphasis. So they could put the verb first. They could put the object first. Greek is is not a word order language. And so because of that, there's going to be different ways of writing things. And it's very clear, it's very clear to a scholar or a person who understands ancient languages which version they're quoting from. Is it the Hebrew or is it the Septuagint? So that's why it's important for you to know that. Um, just so that way if you're reading stuff, or uh, it, it, helps us, it helps frame uh, the context of, of our, these biblical authors um, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it just helps us to know what they're referring to. I'll, that's enough I'll say about that. But you shouldn't, this shouldn't bring any doubt in your mind. You don't need to know this other than just know the historical fact that the Septuagint is the major, major Old Testament source uh, that the New Testament writers and Jesus himself uh, were, were using. Okay. Uh, the Septuagint was commonly used during the time of Christ in the early Christian church as it was written in Greek. Oh, I already read that. Yeah, I already read all that. Well, let's keep going now. Uh, the Apocrypha. So let's talk about the Apocrypha. Um, the Apocrypha identifies 14 books positioned between the Old and New Testaments of some Bibles. Written between the 1st and 3rd centuries B.C., these books are not found in the Hebrew Old Testament and were never quoted by Jesus. So those two reasons alone are good reason for us not to include it in the Old Testament canon. Jesus never quotes from it, and it's never found in any copies of the Hebrew Old Testament. The Apocrypha, a name derived from the Greek word meaning hidden, include uh, 1st Esdras, 2nd Esdras, Tobit, Judith, uh, Rest of Esther, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, Song of the Three Holy Children, History of Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, 
Prayer of Manassas, 1st Maccabees, and 2nd Maccabees. And again, I mentioned those Maccabees books already. Uh, those are, of all those that I just mentioned, 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees are the most intriguing because they are basically just historical accounts. They don't make, they're not bizarre visions. Some of these things are weird. They're very hard for us to read, and, and we definitely won't be able to understand them without a, a commentary because uh, they're just they're just odd. Uh, but the Maccabees are, are straightforward. Uh, Wisdom of Solomon reads a lot like pre, uh, Proverbs. Um, that's an interesting book. Uh, Baruch is interesting too. Um, so is Ecclesiasticus. Uh, but yeah, okay, I could probably go through all these and find something positive to say about them all. Um, but if you're going to read any of them, go to the Maccabees because that, again, sets the stage for why the Jewish people don't like the Roman authorities or other governing authorities. I mean, it's just it's rooted in them. Um, it's kind of like Americans for a while with the British. Uh, you know, it's rooted in our blood. You know, you got the, the Boston Tea Party. You got the, the Revolutionary War, right? There's this, there's, there, there's inherent, it's kind of lost nowadays. But, you know, for those first 150, 200 years of, of, um, of the United States of America, there was like this animosity with the British. Um, it, it gives you that sense, the Maccabees gives you that sense for the Jewish people towards Rome. Okay. Uh, what language did people speak in the Holy Land when Jesus was born? This is about on page 271. Let's go to page 272. After the return of God's people from the Babylonian captivity, Aramaic gradually replaced Hebrew as the language commonly spoken by the people of Palestine. Aramaic was the ancient language of Syria, and it is similar to Hebrew. Very similar. In fact, it looks the same. It's like the same alphabet. Uh, sometimes just a few letters are different. Uh, Jesus spoke and taught in Aramaic, but he was undoubtedly also familiar with Hebrew, Greek, and perhaps even Latin. Um, oh, I wanted to say something about that, but I can't remember, so it's okay. Who are the religious groups that figure prominently in the New Testament? And this is great. This is a very important section for us when we're reading the New Testament, so we understand who these groups are when we can counter them. So first you've got the Sanhedrin. This is the council. They are uh, thought to have originated in the 3rd century BC. We don't know exactly for sure. <clears throat> this group of 70 members led the Jewish people in the days of Christ. Among the 70 members <clears throat> were priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, and elders. The high priest presided over the group. That's why it's also called the council. But that's the Sanhedrin. Notice it's got all of those different groups. Priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, etc. Now the Pharisees... They were a sect that rose as a reaction to those among God's people desiring to adopt Greek culture with its pagan religions. The Pharisees interpreted God's law so the people could live righteously before God according to it. They wielded powerful influence among the people and were the only Jewish religious group to survive the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Modern Judaism can be traced to them. So notice how the Pharisees got started. It was with good intentions. Um, because remember, the lingua franca uh, leading up to, Jew to Jesus' time, so even though the Romans were in power, everyone was speaking Greek because of King Alexander. Remember, that's why we just learned about this, the Greek period. So e Greek is the predominant language. And wherever a predominant language exists, the culture behind that language will influence the people. And the Greeks were entirely pagan. You know, they had all those, all the, all their false gods, the pantheon of gods. And so, as Greek is the predominant culture, uh, pre predominant language of the of the world, essentially, those cultural influence start impacting the Jewish religion, the religion of the Old Testament. And so, people started assimilating into the Greek culture. So the Pharisees, with good intentions, come in and say, hey, we, we got to remain faithful to God's word of the Old Testament. Because remember, the Lord had given all those ceremonial laws, um, all those civil laws, all those, all those, you know, all the moral laws still applied, but um, particular to the Jewish people. And, and the people started drifting away into Greek culture. So Pharisees had good intentions. But this is why, by the way, by the time Jesus comes around, the Pharisees have just gone over the top with it. So remember, there's all these ridiculous rules that they, the people had to obey. Um, and, and it just got, it just got, this is what happens when the law predominates. When the law predominates, we just go off the deep end. We have too many laws. I mean, this is kind of where the United States is heading. Uh, you know, I make the joke all the time that in my, my home state in New York, there is a law forbidding everything. I mean, everything you want to do. There's there's some law that you have to that you're supposed to know about. I mean, the, the job of politicians in New York, it seems, is to just keep making new laws. You know, we're, we're, well, if, if this isn't for, if we haven't touched this area yet, let's forbid this too. That's ridiculous. It's insane. 
Um, but this is what happens when the law predominates. This is why the Pharisees get in so much trouble uh, in Jesus' time. All right, let's talk about the Sadducees here, bottom of 272. They're an aristocratic sect heavily influenced by secular thought and Greek customs. This is why the Pharisees and Sadducees don't get along. They were liberals and free thinkers. Though they controlled the council, they were appropriately characterized as irreligious in nature. Unlike the Pharisees, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Why? Because they're liberals, they're free thinkers. Um, so this is in part why... Um, so you know, you always know the joke, the way you remember the Sadducees is because they are sad, you see. Because they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't have the hope of the resurrection, which is all our joy. And that's the joy of being a Christian. We've got that sure hope that our bodies are going to be raised from the dead. But the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. All right, let's talk about the scribes. <clears throat> now the scribes copied studied and interpreted scripture. Um, now we usually think of scribes just for their copying aspect of their vocation, but they were more importantly those who studied and interpreted. These are your theologians. So the Pharisees are kind of like your um, the guys who, who figure out how to apply it to everyday life. The Sadducees are, are always trying to walk the line of contemporary culture, which is why they're the liberal ones. And then your scribes, these are your like academics. Okay, so those, if you break down the three groups, your Pharisees, those are your, here's the rules to follow, you know, um, you're, they're your neighborhood watch. <laughs> I got to think, I'm, I got to think about that, but Pharisees are basically your neighborhood watch. Your Sadducees are, let's see what's trending on Twitter uh, or on the internet, and we're going to try to make, we're going to try to make the religion conform to that so, so we can be cool and hip with everybody, hence they're liberal. Uh, the sad, uh, I'm sorry, and the scribes, those are your exegetes, those are your theologians, those are the ones who are studying God's word. Because of their vast knowledge I'm reading here, they were considered experts in the law and sometimes served as lawyers. The role of scribes was especially important uh, before the days of printing. Okay, um, we are almost done here. I know it's been a long study. We're almost done. Um, where do the people worship in the New Testament world? This is important to talk about. So they had the temple. This is a physical structure built as God's dwelling place among his people. Located in Jerusalem, the temple will remain the center of Jewish worship. Here people came to offer blood sacrifices for the sins of the people and to pray. Jesus, the ultimate indwelling of God among his people, referred to himself as a temple. He came to, it to take away the sins of all people once and for all. And so this is why once the temple falls in Jerusalem, our temple still exists. Our temple is Jesus, the word made flesh who dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. So wherever Jesus is, wherever his word is, wherever two or more are gathered in his name, there is the temple. There is God among us. Now synagogues. Um, synagogues, houses for religious teaching and worship. Synagogues were begun during the days of exile when the people were cut off from the temple. Early Christians modeled their church life and elements of worship after that of the synagogue. So if you couldn't be in Jerusalem because you were exiled, synagogue was uh, basically like a, a house church. <laughs> More or less. Synagogue, by the way, means gathering together. So it's just a, 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 a gathering. Um, that's basically what synagogue means, if you wanted to translate it literally from the Greek. Um, homes. Uh, the Passover meal was a family event from the time of its first observance in Exodus 12. In Jewish tradition, the head of the household was responsible for the faith, nurture, and devotional life of the family. And this still applies to the Christian life today. Because we get this in the New Testament, so we don't get it just from the Old Testament. Paul talks about this in the New Testament. Remember Ephesians 6. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but, uh, what's the verb? Instruct them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I think it's instruct. I can't remember now. But the point being that dads, don't provoke your kids to anger. Instruct them in the Christian faith. That's your role. Um, so that's even in the New Testament. Similarly, this responsibility exists among Christian families. Oh, there's your Ephesians 6.4 reference. If I just flipped the page, I would have seen that. Luther noted this frequently in the Catechism, summarizing Christian doctrine as how we start this class and every class, as the head of the family should teach it in a simple way to his household. Early Christians, especially during times of persecution, met in small groups in people's homes to worship, support, and encourage one another and to enjoy a time of fellowship. Because being together is always encouraging. That's in Hebrews. Do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as the day of the Lord draweth near. What features, then, made the world in which Christ was born ready to receive the world's uh, Savior? So the Greek language gave the world a common voice. The Old Testament and eventually the New Testament languages were available in the universal language of the day. So extremely important historical point. 
Roman transportation and communication facilitated the efficient spreading of the gospel. So see how God works through all these incredible means? So they got one common language, and now you've got this vast uh, transportation system, so the word of God can spread quickly. The dispersion of God's people throughout the world provided strategic mission contacts. Think of all of Paul's letters to the uh, church in Ephesus. you got the uh, church in Thessalonica. Um, you've got the church in Rome, the church in the province of Galatia, Corinth, um, Ephesus, Ephesus, did I say Ephesus already? Colossae. I'm just going through all the epistles. So you got all these points of uh, contact, these mission contacts. Uh, and then lastly, the promises of the Old Testament were ripe for fulfillment, so that at just the right time and place, the stone the builders rejected might give his life to save all people, and in so doing, construct a new religion of the old, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That's Ephesians 2 verse 20. But I would also uh, say that that first line where it says that just at the right time and place, Paul says this in Romans. He says at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And the right time, that Greek word is kairos. And um, so think of chronos as a uh, sequential time, like timeline, chronology, right? Um, the Greeks have another way of thinking about time, and it's kairos. It, it, we would kind of use the word like um, coincidence or... Uh, uh, what are the other ones? Where, where things just, where, where you can't put words to it or explain it, where you just know that, hey, this this happened, at, it, it was the per, timing was perfect, right? So many people, if, if uh, you know, when, when the timing is just right in your life or something happened, you just know, oh, man, this is the right time. That's kairos in the Greek mindset. Well, at just the right time, at just the kairos, Christ dies for the ungodly, and that's how the word is able to be spread throughout the, throughout the world. So thanks be to God for his time. So I think of kairos as God's time. God's timing of things, um, where we can't put human words to it. Um, that's just kind of how I explain it. So Kairos, God's time, Kronos is our, our timeline, our chronology. All right, that's it for our class today. So let's close with the way we always close, um, by praying uh, the prayers that we usually pray. Let's pray Psalm 23 together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. All right, we will close there today because this video is getting a little long. We'll see you next week uh, for class. Um, well... We got a test next week, so class number 11, uh, we'll do a review for that. But the next class will be class number 12, in which now we introduce you to the three creeds of the church. We're going to talk about God's attributes, and we'll have a, a possibly a discussion over the hymnal. Um, so yeah, see you for class number 12. God be with you.